Now in this video we want to be thinking about the process of absorption and the point of anatomy of particular interest for this purpose is the small intestine. So here's the overall diagram of the gastrointestinal tract and the small intestine is going to stretch from the pyloric sphincter at the end of the stomach all the way through to the ileocecal valve where the ileum joins onto the uh, or joins into the cecum. Now as we see from this diagram the small intestine is in three components we have the duodenum, the jejunum, and we have finally the ileum as the distal part. So the duodenum is proximal, the jejunum is in the middle part, medial, and the ileum is distal, parts of the small intestine. And it's called small because it's more narrow, as we see the lumen is more narrow than in the large intestine. Now the length of the small intestine varies a fair bit between individuals. Studies have shown it's between 3 and 8.5 metres in length, with the uh, average being round about 5 metres in length. Now you may well see longer figures than this quoted in the textbooks and that's because the textbooks are based on old data which is taken from post-mortem studies. But the 5 metre average is the length of the small intestine as measured during surgical procedures when the patient is alive because at death the smooth muscle in the small intestine will relax and the small intestine becomes longer if we measure it on the bench. But in all probability your small intestine is about, uh, it's about 5 metres in length. Now what we want to do now is look at these structures here. The small intestine, the circular folds, the villi and the microvilli because it's this anatomy that gives the small intestine a remarkably large internal surface area. The surface area between the mucosa and the submucosa of the small intestine and the lumen of the small intestine through which absorption takes place. This very large surface area is facilitated by this particularly interesting arrangement of uh, anatomical and histological structures. So first of all, let's think about the small intestine. So here's the length of the small intestine, just here. And it's got a muscular wall, we could draw a muscular wall in there. So there's the muscular wall of the small intestine. Right, and inside, as we know, there's a mucosa, and under the mucosa there is, is a submucosa. Now the submucosa is arranged in folds like this. So it's folded on the inside. These folds that project into the lumen of the small intestine. And I think if you look at those already, you can see that we have a much uh, larger surface area exposed between the lumen and the submucosa here. So this is the submucosa. This black line is actually the mucosa. This is the surface mucous membrane of the small intestine. And we see that these circular folds are greatly increasing the surface area. This would be the, uh, this would be the submucosa just here in this area here. In fact, we could just colour that in to clarify it. So this area here is the submucosa. And the submucosa is so important because it contains the blood vessels which are going to collect the absorbed nutrients. And the venous branches are going to go to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. The lymphatic branches are going to go into the lymphatic system to be drained back into the blood separately. So there we have the submucosa. So what we've drawn here are, are the circular folds. These are circular folds. So that's one circular fold, that's another circular fold there. So large circular folds of mucosa project into the lumen of the small intestine. This is the lumen in the middle here, the gap down the middle. Now these are not present in actually the, uh, the first part of the duodenum and they disappear in the distal ileum but the rest of the small intestine has these circular folds. And they're visible macroscopically. Um, they're up to eight millimeters deep. And one large fold actually alternates with a, with a smaller fold. So it's a fairly precise arrangement of these circular folds. 
<laughs> and we can actually look at this anatomy in in uh, in some in some more detail. So let's uh, let's imagine these are the circular folds here. These are the circular folds. A little bit larger this time. Blowing up a bit. So they're the circular folds in the lumen of the small intestine. Now, as you probably know, and as we've mentioned, the walls of the small intestine are lined with a uh, muscle. So just here, um, just here, there's going to be a layer of circular muscle. So this muscle is circular in nature. The muscle fibers running around about the diameter of the gastrointestinal tract. Then on the outside of those, there's a layer of longitudinal muscle fibers that run longitudinally. Of course, we need both circular and longitudinal to facilitate the process of peristalsis. And then finally on the outside here, there's a layer of uh, serosa, the outside tissue of the gastrointestinal tract. And at the level of the small intestine, that is going to consist of the, the visceral peritoneum, the visceral peritoneal membrane. And this fairly large area here, this submucosa, that's going to contain many uh, blood vessels. It's going to contain, uh, it's going to contain lymphatics. There's going to be lymphatic vessels here as well. There's going to be lymphatic vessels draining away into larger lymphatic vessels in this, in this submucosal layer. So we've seen we've got uh, the small intestine and the circular folds, but the next layer of complexity is the, the villi. So what are, what are these villi? Well, if you've got good eyes, the villi are just visible to the human eye. And the villi are present on the circular folds like this. So these would be the villi, not drawn to scale here, much smaller than this. The villi would be in this position here. So these will be villi lining the circular folds. So the actual mucous membrane itself is, is enfolded in these villi. It goes up and it goes down with the villi. And as we've said, these villi are just visible to the human eye. And the villi are actually um, highly vascular projections of the mucosal surface. And they cover the entire surface of the uh, intestinal mucosa. The small intestine is completely lined with these villi. And what they do is we can see that the surface area has already increased with the circular folds, while the villi, they increase the surface area even more. And in fact, the villi alone increase the surface area by times seven. So the surface area is seven times greater because of the presence of these villi on the circular folds. And there's about 10 to 40 of these villi per millimetre, per, per square millimetre. So if we take a square millimetre surface area, 10 to 40 villi there. Uh, when I said these were visible to the, to the eye, they're probably not visible to mine. If you've got young fit eyes, I'm sure you could probably just see them, but they are quite small and, and close together. So 10 to 40 per um, cubic millimetre and height wise they're about 0 0.5 to 1 millimetre in, in height so the scale here is if that's a, a good size villi there that line from there to there would be 1 millimetre so next we can look at a, a villi in, in, in a villus in more detail one a villus several villi so here, here we see the, uh, the, the the villus here. That's one there, like that. So what we've drawn there in larger magnification is one one of those. So we're, we're sort of zoomed into that level now. So we've zoomed in from the circular folds to the uh, to the villi on the circular folds. Now we've zoomed into one one villus. Now between individual villi, there's actually a an indented area like this, interstinal crypts. There like that, then there'll be another another villus there like that. Then there'll be another interstinal crypt there. And another villus. 
so that's the kind of arrangement that we see in the in the villi now in the center of each uh, villus we're going to have a, a lymphatic it's called a lacteal so there's a central lacteal in the center of each villus and the smaller lymphatic vessels are going to drain into that and then these are going to connect to larger lymphatic vessels further down in the submucosa with the lymph eventually draining away into the larger lymphatic vessels and this is important because the fat soluble materials are absorbed into the lymphatic system not into the blood vascular system and then we're going to have blood vessels here so there's going to be arterial vessels small branches going off here like this and there's going to be an arterial vessel going up say this side of the the villi and that's going to send out blood vessels across the individual villus like this that's going to go into uh, venous vessels which are going to drain again into uh, as we'd expect into larger uh, into larger venous vessels so we have the lymphatic supply we have the blood supply going in going in like this we have the venous blood draining out and we have the blind ended lymphatic capillaries collecting lymphatic fluid and, and fat soluble material now this of course is the lumen of the small intestine here so water soluble products of digestion are going to go into the blood supply the monosaccharides and the amino acids for example are going to go into the blood supply and we can see that they're all going to be drained all these nutrients are going to be drained via this vessel here one of the venous vessels and that's going all these vessels are going to join up they're going to form the hepatic portal vein and they're going to take this blood directly to the liver but fat soluble material is going to be absorbed into the lymphatic lacteal and again that's going to drain away into progressively larger lymphatic vessels so we've got the infolding of the circular folds the infolding of the villi and we've seen the infolding of the villi here but there's another particularly fascinating area of infolding as well because the surface of each villus is itself lined with numerous microvilli so the surface area of this is also greatly enhanced with these microvilli so we see all these layers of infolding so the surface area of a, a villus is greatly enhanced by the presence of the microvilli on its surface now just before we go and look at these uh, microvilli in more detail let's just use this diagram from the physiology notes books to uh, physiology notes book to uh, summarize where we're at so first of all we noted that the intestine itself had circular folds then we noticed that this is all one circular fold here that's all one circular fold we noticed that that was lined with the villi then we looked at the individual villi and we now notice that the individual villi are themselves covered with smaller microvilli and these microvilli are generated by the enterocytes and the enterocytes are the most common form of cell lining a villus so each villus of course is going to be lined with uh, this is the diagram we had of the, the villi each one is going to be lined with individual cells like this again not drawn to scale but they're going to be lined with individual cells like this each with their own nucleus of course lining the villi forming the mucous membrane so there's actually a, a single layer of epithelial cells covering the interstinal villi 
And the most common sort of cell lining the villi are the enterocytes. But there's also other cells. For example, there's uh, goblet cells to produce mucus. And actually, just before we go on, I think I'll just tell you that, that uh, in these interstinal crypts, so we have these interstinal crypts here. Um, so these are the interstinal crypts. Now, the stem cells to produce the goblet cells and to produce the, um, the enterocytes are actually in these crypts intestinal crypts, what used to be called the crypts of Lieberkin in the old days. And these are the germ cells, these are, are mitotically dividing. Because it's fairly well known that the gastrointestinal tract is replacing its surface very frequently. And these individual enterocytes actually only live for about five days. They're quite short-lived cells. That's why in uh, clinical practice, when we give patients chemotherapy, they often have quite severe gastrointestinal side effects because that's inhibiting the mitotic activity and preventing this replenishment. So what actually happens is the cells will divide down here and they'll move up onto this mucosa lining the, the villi. But as, as they get older, they, they actually physically move up here like this. <laughs> so so um, a cell down here is going to be maybe uh, 12, 24 hours old, but a cell up here is going to be say four days old. And then eventually the cells get to the top here, up there, and at that stage, the cells uh, commit suicide, this process of apoptosis, and they just flake off into the lumen. So this, this layer is constantly being replaced and there's this flow of cells from the base up to the apex of, of the villi, constantly renewing the mucosa of the lumen of the small intestine quite amazing generation of cells migration of cells and then when they've done the job they just know they've done the job in the commit apoptosis and, and that's then but replaced by younger cells but interesting to note when you're looking if you look at a, a villus under the microscope they're the younger cells there they're the older cells up at the top but as we say only about five days lifespan for these enterocytes and goblet cells so an ongoing process of mitosis from stem cells migration and sloughing off the lining of your small intestine is always young now these enterocytes are particularly amazing cells so let's look at one in in, in more detail. So we've said there's a single layer of epithelium covers the intest intestinal uh, villi, uh, villi, covers the villi. And these are enterocytes and goblet cells from a common stem cell 